golden age of discovery, Spain was seen as the undisputed leader, driven by military tradition and the will of the church. A new world meant a new challenge, as the thirst for conquest became relentless. Today, the same spirit remains, but is played out closer to home. Madrid, the capital, still has its traditions, its monarchy, and its grandeur. But whilst the old regal image persists, it now relies on a different Castilian flag bearer, Real Madrid, to maintain its position at the top. Whilst its more colourful Catalan neighbour and long-standing rival, Barcelona, proudly retains its own broad mix of cultures through a myriad of festivals that reflect its strength of character, rich heritage and solidarity. It's been a shrine for famous artists and avant-garde design, but Catalan pride is most evident when pitted against Madrid on the football field, where one always tries to outdo the other. Whilst the clubs battle it out and nurture a special bond within their ranks, it's the fans who delight in provoking the opposition. And tempers invariably spill over in such a volatile atmosphere. Es molt senzill. No va falta ni que el jugueu perquè el perdereu, segur, perquè no existiu. Machacar a los catalanes. Ai, ai, machacarlos, hay que machacarlos. Machacarlos. Mira, machacarlos. Y Ribardo, y Ribardo, es Ribardo campeón. There's never been a shortage of talent, though, as the rivalry attracts the world's best. Generalmente, lo que más euforia me da es lo que de primero del Barça. There are two giants, let's put that way, which is Barcelona and Madrid, which has always been there. And all the other people has got their team and then Madrid or Barcelona, which means the whole country are for Madrid or Barcelona beside their other team. This is a game that is played el lunes de esa semana, el martes, el miércoles, el jueves, el viernes, se juega de ida y vuelta, se juega con las declaraciones de unos, con las declaraciones de otros, con, lo, con el uno como está en su clasificación. Es un partido que tiene una intensidad especial. Mas la atmósfera y el ambiente que se vive eh, toda la semana, a través de la imprensa, a través de, de, de comentarios, como si fuese siempre eh, el derby del do, do siglo. They live for their football and um, they're hugely passionate about it. And none more so than when a goal is scored. The size and scale of these matches are fought with a religious fervor that reflects much of the historic conflict between the regions of Castilla and Catalonia. Their stadiums resemble cathedrals and are revered in a similar manner. Built almost 50 years ago, these arenas are quite different in design but are still equally regarded among the best in the world, with the match sold out a season in advance. For the uninitiated, it can be a harrowing experience. When you play at Barcelona and you've got 120,000 Catalans screaming like mad, you play in the Bernabeu and you've got, you know, 90 odd thousand from just Real Madrid supporters and there's a handful of away support. And that's where it differs a great deal to derbies elsewhere in the world. Yo nací aquí en Madrid, yo soy socio del Real Madrid desde que, que nací desde el primer día de mi vida, yo eh, soy blanco. Entonces, para mí, jugar en ese estadio, no solamente jugar, sino pasar con el coche cerca del Bernabéu, cuando voy por la castellana, eh, supone algo muy especial. Se me acelera el pulso. <risa> yo creo que uno no se puede ir de un periodo profesional sin haber jugado en uno de esos dos estadios, porque es realmente inolvidable. If there's such a huge stadium, with such an ambience, it doesn't matter if they, they whistle or they shout, or it's, it's just beautiful. Both clubs are obsessive about the other, and everything has a hidden political agenda. During the Civil War, especially in Barcelona, the stadiums were the only refuge where freedom of speech could be exercised without fear. Both have become enduring symbols for fans ever since, 
to voice their opinion and support. Real Madrid have been the most consistently successful football club in the world. Their monopoly of the European Cup in the 1950s and their present resurgence have reinforced that, along with FIFA's official rubber stamp as the best club side of the last century. The early games between Madrid's student team and a group of privileged foreigners who founded Barcelona did little to reveal the passion and quality of the sides in later years, when club football expanded onto the international stage. Madrid, under the strong arm of club president Santiago Bernabeu and the genius of Alfredo Di Stefano, soon asserted themselves as Bernabeu stopped at nothing to create his dream team. Franco proudly endorsed them as Spain's finest ambassadors. In the 1960 European Cup final, television would, for the first time, allow viewers around the world to see just why they were a class apart. Their stylish, free-flowing passing game completely dominated their German rivals, Eintracht Frankfurt. Inevitably, it was Di Stefano, playing conductor and goalscorer, and the deadly accuracy of the Hungarian, Ferenc Puskas, who destroyed the Germans. 134,000 Scottish fans were treated to a virtuoso team performance with Real Madrid emphatic winners by seven goals to three. Whilst Madrid put a rapid stranglehold on Europe, back home it only intensified the rivalry with Barcelona, who had created probably the second best team in Europe, but with little publicity outside of Spain to confirm it. Few teams could lay claim to beating Madrid in the 1950s. Barcelona not only succeeded, but did it in style. Whilst Madrid had Di Stefano, Barcelona had the Hungarian maestro Ladislao Kubala, who derived two years earlier than Di Stefano and played a major role in Barcelona gaining the upper hand. Every derby was a matter of life and death, where victory always had a political edge. Di Stefano's first derby resulted in a stirring 5-0 victory. His two goals made him an instant hero with the Madrid fans. In 1958, Barcelona signed the Argentine coach, Elenio Herrera. An accomplished tactician and psychologist, Herrera, using the precocious talents of the brilliant Luis Suarez, a fading but still resourceful Kubala, national goalkeeper Ramayets, and Hungarian exiles Kocic and Tibor, molded a side that would win successive league titles, the European Fierce Cup, and become the first team to knock Real Madrid out of the European Cup. Arguably, though, the most important signing for Barcelona was the quicksilver Johan Cruyff. The incomparable skills of the elusive Dutchman created huge excitement on his arrival in the early 70s, and he did not disappoint his fans. His achievements as a player would earn him both club and major individual awards. The most telling award, however, was in the scoreline, where the number five had always been a landmark for both sides. Cinco zero, cinco. Cruyff's first derby would be in Madrid, where reputations amounted for little. It would be a fiery baptism, but Cruyff was never better than when faced with a challenge. After taking an early lead, Cruyff showed his own brand of magic, scoring a second and having a hand in everything else, as a stunned Madrid crowd could only watch in silence as Barcelona demolished their heroes 5-0. 20 years later, with Cruyff now manager of what many regarded as Barcelona's dream team, they went about carving their own piece of history. First, the masterful Romario opened the gates with a brilliant individual effort, followed by a trademark Ronald Koeman free kick. Madrid officials were tense, but would be in a lot more pain by the end of the day, as Romario collected his second with ease. And with the help of the elegant Dane, Michael Laudrup, his hat-trick. But it was still not over, as Romario, with a brilliant piece of interplay, set up the elusive fifth goal, much to the delight of the Barcelona fans, who savoured every minute of this victory and shared a sense of déjà vu with Cruyff. 
Twelve months later in Madrid, as reigning league champions, a confident Barcelona took on a pence in Madrid. But if this was the case, someone hadn't told the Chilean Samorano, whose lethal shooting had earned him the nickname Bam Bam. Samorano was on a roll, with another clinically executed finish that had new manager Jorge Valdano ecstatic. The tenacity of newly defected Barcelona star Michael Laudrup quickly set up Samorano's third. More was to follow. Samorano narrowly missed grabbing a fourth before Luis Enrique obliged. Revenge was almost complete as a revitalized Madrid put the final fifth nail in the Barcelona coffin. The winds of change for Cruyff were taking their toll. A long-time cigarette junkie with the usual managerial pressures, mounting boardroom conflict through his outspokenness, and insistence to play his type of attacking football had already put him in hospital and made him a regular target for an unforgiving Spanish media in which satirists were only too keen to impersonate and lampoon. La llegada de Cruyff cambió muchas cosas en el club, sobre todo por su mentalidad ganadora, ¿no? Pero introdujo cosas que nosotros no, no, habíamos, no habíamos visto todavía. Yo era muy joven, pero, pero sí la sensación de ser un jugador diferente, ¿no? De alguien que hacía, dentro del fútbol, que siempre parece que está todo inventado, pues hacía cosas diferentes, ¿no? Tácticamente muy, muy bueno. Uno de los mejores. That's why I think that playing well is, is, is very important, because only winning, I don't think that's enough. Cruyff's record is an enviable one. Respected as a player's player and a manager with a belief in his convictions, he also has more trophies to show for it than anyone else, the most coveted being the elusive European Cup in 1992. Whilst Cruyff allowed his detractors to take the glory, he knew this was the one trophy that would bridge the great divide between Barcelona and their eternal rivals, Real Madrid and gain the club the recognition of being at long last the bride rather than the frustrated bridesmaid. The Barcelona-Real Madrid rivalry is known as the never-ending war for good reason. A recent survey amongst Barcelona fans showed 48% were happier to see Madrid lose than Barcelona win. The tribal rivalry is a cartoonist dream, as everything has a meaning that can be manipulated or used to commercial value. And what better carrot to use than the greatest prize of the war? Both clubs now have their own TV stations that offer subscribers everything they could possibly want to know about their clubs and more. Hype is everything. And success is paramount, not just because the club is Real Madrid, but because it's the key to drawing more subscribers into the fold. Whilst Real Madrid TV choose to stress their achievements, Canal Barça prefer to concentrate on their language and cultural status, as well as the club's range of stars. The club has an enormous family tradition. Rivalry on either side has indeed become as much a business as an institution. A rifle is something fantastic. I mean, you mustn't take that away because there's no rifle, there's no game. Está muy claro que una persona que viene de fuera no no entiende en muchos casos qué significa la rivalidad Madrid Barcelona y a veces pues no tiene al alcance de su de su mente la posibilidad de entenderlo. No, you play in an ordinary league match, then it's relatively quiet. You play against Real Madrid, it's like some sort of explosion when you come out the tunnel, fireworks, and it's absolutely packed. It's just different. Pero bueno, vamos a ver. No me digas que no es bonito ver el Real Madrid blanco con los mosaicos, que parece que haya nevado, aunque esté en verano, ha nevado en verano. And then, of course, there are the sponsors. Creo que la gente no se da cuenta qué significa jugar tantos partidos. Pero todos los partidos de liga, que ya son los de Copa. Y una vez jugada la Supercopa, vemos a Europa para jugar todos los partidos de la Liga de Champions. Pero estoy contento que los jugadores estén en forma, aunque yo esté fuera de juego. We need this back.
Big images mean big money, with exposure being the name of the game. Merchandising spin-offs through sportswear and endorsements have increased dramatically. The bigger the club, the more marketable they are. And they don't come much bigger than Real Madrid and Barcelona, who have a vast global network. Training sessions are covered in depth by their own broadcasters as they produce reports on everything that might influence a player's performance in the lead-up to an important game. With fan clubs spread throughout the country, large numbers of supporters make the pilgrimage to catch a glimpse of their heroes in action. But they invariably take second place to a media well versed in grabbing the best position. Most are after one thing only, the image that will later create a talking point at the daily press conferences. Training often reveals underlying friction amongst certain players. Both teams have a strict policy that the club is bigger than any individual and should always be an inspiration to others. With so many top-class players competing for first-team places, it needs a strong manager with a good vision to make the right decisions for club and player. If ever strong leadership was needed, it was during the 1930s civil war. Spain was in turmoil. A military coup headed by General Franco fought a bitter war of ideology against the ruling Republicans, dividing family and friends against each other. Franco's fascist ideals brought him questionable allies, as patriot and partisan died in huge numbers, including Barcelona's young president, Josep Suñol, in the first week of the war. A popular Catalan politician as well, Suñol's tragic death would intensify the already bitter feelings between Catalan and Castilla. Franco, though, went from strength to strength. A role model for most football coaches, he cleverly played his enemies off against each other. In 1941, controversy surrounded the political intimidation used to influence the outcome of an infamous cup match between the two sides. O sea, que había una pasión contra el Barcelona porque era catalán y como Cataluña fue la última que, que, que en la guerra cayó, digamos, pues y la pasión esta ya, ya existía, ¿me entiendes? Deporte fue también un elemento que el franquismo utilizó para demostrar su potencia. En aquel momento la dictadura no tenía presencia en el mundo. Por tanto, el gobierno utilizó también el deporte para su expansión exterior y por esto el Real Madrid ganó siete copas. El Real Madrid estuvo a punto de ser disuelto por Franco. Estuvo a punto de ser disuelto por Franco porque eh, había sido, había quitado el Real durante la República y había tenido unas conexiones con partidos eh, progresistas y de izquierdas durante la República. Hubo que nombrar a un general, el general Meléndez, presidente, para salvar al Real Madrid de la disolución. Una vez más, es que el Barcelona tiene una buena política de imagen y se inventa las historias muy bien inventadas. El fútbol hemos de intentar, como todo el deporte, que esté apartado de la política. However, since the war, every match seemed like a return to arms. Franco's control had been absolute. His own cup tournament matches were more like a show of solidarity, and the partisan Madrid crowd needed little excuse to show off their hatred towards their bitter Catalan rivals. Despite such tension, a frail Franco would have the good fortune of seeing his last cup final won by his beloved Real Madrid against the old enemy. For many, Franco's death was a relief. Now the country could at last look to rebuilding bridges with one another. No one person better exemplifies the image and character of Real Madrid than its feisty ex-president Santiago Bernabeu. It was his defiant vision at a time when Spain was still suffering from the ravages of civil war and global isolation to build not just any stadium but an icon of Spanish nationalism and a showcase to the rest of the world. Bernabeu era un hombre del fútbol y él había sido jugador, amateur en el Madrid, había sido luego directivo, había sido secretario técnico 
y en un momento determinado llega a la presidencia y cree desde el mundo del fútbol, porque él sí tenía ese espíritu deportivo y futbolístico, que luego se ha perdido en muchas juntas directivas, que lo han visto más como negocio que como manifestación de deporte, y él lo que buscaba era que su equipo fuera el mejor, nada más, y acertó. Él supo que el fútbol iba a ser la distracción de la gente eh, humilde, y él eh, apostó por hacer un estadio grande. Many believed Bernabéu to be crazy, misled by the grandeur of Spain's golden past. Crazy he wasn't, but as an ex-soldier in Franco's army, who'd been part of the offensive against Catalonia, nothing motivated him more than to create something his enemies in Barcelona didn't have. The sense of expectation was huge, as crowds flocked to the stadium to show their support. The opening match was against local rivals Atletico Madrid. Fiercely competitive, they were in no mood to play just a supporting role, as in the early days of Franco's regime, they were more respected than Real. Di Stefano is the best overall player that I ever saw. He is the brainiest player that I ever saw. And I only saw him when he was in his 30s. And I always try to imagine what he would have been like when he was about 18 or 19. He must have been wonderful. Ha sido el hombre más completo que ha habido, con velocidad en aquella época, y era muy rápido, con mucha inteligencia, era un líder. Di Stefano and Real Madrid were destined to be the perfect match. Three goals against Madrid playing for Colombia's Millonarios in 1952 convinced Bernabeu this was the player he had to have. Di Stefano had learned his craft with the great Argentine team, River Plate, who still officially controlled his contract and had struck a deal with Barcelona. Millonarios, though, believed otherwise. Nosotros viajamos contratados por el club Real Madrid. Real Madrid fue contratado. Yo me comprometí con el presidente del Real Madrid, Santiago Bernabéu, que si Di Stefano quería irse para España, Millonarios se lo cedía única y exclusivamente al Real Madrid. No olvidemos que el Madrid cuando construyó el nuevo estadio, Santiago Bernabéu, en los campos mucho más pequeño que ahora, pero ya en ese sitio era un, una inversión muy importante y el Real Madrid entonces era un equipo que estaba a punto de bajar a segunda división. De hecho se hablaba entonces de que para qué se, constru se construyó un estadio eh, tan grande para un equipo de segunda. What appeared insurmountable was rumored to have been resolved by Franco himself. Bernabeu had the ear of the president and made his case very clear. Di Stefano did not disappoint them. The duels now with Barcelona would prove to be a huge draw card, as the Catalans had their own superstar in Ladislao Kubala. A Czech-Hungarian duel international, Kubala had come to Spain in 1950 and became an instant hit with Barcelona. The prospect of Di Stefano and Kubala joining forces would have been a national disaster for Madrid. Kubala fue el responsable de que el Barcelona construyera el Camp Nou, porque el Barcelona tenía otro estadio en las Corts y se quedó pequeño de la gente que quería ir a ver a Kubala, ¿no? Kubala pues impuso, enseñó, enseñó, perfeccionó, mejor dicho, algunos de nuestros jugadores que verdaderamente fueron poco más adelante se convirtieron en verdaderos cracks. Di Stefano's skills were consummate. He could score goals in any manner and taunt the opposition just like a seasoned matador. As did Kubala. They knew the crowds had come to watch them. And the bigger the audience, the greater their performance. And of course, the trophies never stopped. They would eventually play together for Espanyol, but only in the twilight of their careers. The support for Real Madrid is not just confined to Madrid. Tradition and television have established fan clubs worldwide, even within Barcelona itself. The Marengs have earned their nickname for obvious reasons, and their boys in white try hard not to disappoint them. El Madrid es grande, pero por sí solo, porque existe una familia detrás del Madrid madridista que, que, que es lo más grande del mundo. Madrid's achievements have now earned them legendary status. Players are bred on success and conditioned into believing they have a privileged right to succeed. Beautiful football is their trademark, and the fans expect nothing less. El pan tumaca este que hacen los catalanes, que eso es que de vago, fregado. 
por favor, fegar un tomate aquí con la grandeza del calamar metido en su pan. El calamar, que es metido la síntesis del mar en la tierra. ¿Sabe para lo que sirve el vaso en la gastronomía? Para fregar los vasos. Esto, con esto utilizo yo para fregar los vasos. Madrid's heritage of great players is vast. Gento and Pushkash both played vital roles in creating the aura of invincibility in the 1950s. Each era has its stars, but it's the strikers who inevitably take the driver's seat. Like the Mexican acrobat of the 1980s, Hugo Sanchez, who could score goals with ease from anywhere, anyhow. Madrid's Trophy Museum is a vivid testimony to its past glories. In Emilio Butragueño, Madrid had another natural predator with a knack of being in the right place at the right time. Whilst victories in the World Club Championship had consolidated Real's global reputation even further. In the Chilean Ivan Zamorano, they found a goal scorer as ruthless as Sanchez. And of course today there is Raúl, whose undeniable talents have won accolades wherever he plays. Success has also helped Madrid create their own lifestyle center next to the Bernabeu Stadium. Here you can buy just about anything from a team strip to a high quality watch to clothing, a Real Madrid wine label, tennis rackets, bed linen, and a vintage red, or better still, white. Barcelona's centenary festival clearly demonstrated how broad its global image had spread. Known better as Barça, their motto, no ordinary football club, is easy to understand why. Most fans wear their Barça hat on their sleeve. Esa pasión de padres a hijos, de abuelos a padres, eh, toda la familia sigue una tradición. Ser del Barça es algo que se lleva muy dentro, ¿no? Jamás pensé que algún día formaría parte del, del Barcelona. Y cuando fiché este verano por el club, bueno, pues eh, para mí ha sido algo que, que se me escapaba, ¿no? Jamás que creería que, que jugaría aquí. Es especial. Es más que un club. It is the spiritual side of Barça, though, that many feel separates it from other clubs. Historically, this presence has come from Montserrat, an old Benedictine monastery high up in the jagged mountains close to Barcelona, and the perceived mystical qualities of the Black Madonna. La Moreneta has played a major role in Catalan society for well over five centuries, especially overseeing the welfare of FC Barcelona. El día que juego a Barça, pues paso por la Virgen y le digo, no me falles. It is also rumored that the medieval knight Parsifal discovered the Holy Grail here. With such a powerful combination, it's no wonder Barcelona maintain a home for the Madonna within the stadium itself. Montserrat y la Virgen de la Merced, que es la patrona de Barcelona. Esas dos vírgenes han velado siempre para la salud de todo el Barcelona, de todos sus socios, de sus jugadores, de todo. The building of the Camp Nou Stadium and the laying of the first stone was a major cultural event. The church and the Madonna were called upon to consecrate and protect this citadel of Catalan solidarity. The history of the club is beautifully recreated within its impressive museum. Its first president and founder was Hans Gamper. Swiss by birth, his love for the game as a player and administrator helped set the path for Barca's future glories and introduced the club and country to its first superstar, Pepe Samitier. Samitier was a star on and off the field. A romantic of the 1920s, his supple body and acrobatic contortions earned him the nickname The Lobster. He would also become the first player to lay the switch ranks to Real Madrid. Si Samitier traspaso fue un reloj de pulsera, no tan bonito como este, más barato, pero él aportó al Barcelona toda su personalidad, que la tenía mucha. Era un hombre muy querido en toda España, no solamente en Barcelona, en Madrid era un hombre que lo adoraban. While Samitier was revered, the most important quest for the club would be the European Champions Cup for which no expense would be spared. A Latin dependent started in earnest with the brilliant but volatile Diego Maradona for a world record transfer fee of $6 million, 
but it made him a target for every butcher wishing to trigger his volatile short fuse. Next to come would be the wayward but equally gifted Brazilian Romario, who could score goals better than anyone. The precocious talents of boy wonder Ronaldo would follow, enticed by another world record transfer. He could achieve goals out of nothing, both delighting and exasperating his coaches. Until his recent controversial transfer, Luis Figo's mesmerizing ball skills made him the fans' real hero. But the one player who seems to have it all is the multi-talented, deceptive playmaker Rivaldo, who carves up the opposition with arrogant ease. A much-cherished icon for Barca is old grandpa, who stands as a protector of La Masia, a refuge for the next wave of young Barca hopefuls wishing to emulate their most notable local hero, Pepe Guardiola, the club captain. Barcelona strongly believe in looking after their players, both the untried and the veterans, who still maintain a close affinity with the club. In an era where marketing has now become almost as important as the game itself, Barcelona have developed one of the most sophisticated and profitable merchandise centers in the world, where nothing escapes the opportunity for exploitation. Image requires exposure, and how better to fuel it than with a media that is obsessed with overkill, be it radio, television or print. Conflict, controversy and exaggeration have turned the sport almost into an overpriced suspense thriller where inflated egos and fees have been spoon-fed in search of a story and by agents eager to raise the price of their next would-be if he could be star. The highly competitive daily sports newspapers use any trick available to create a story that might give them a lead over their opposition. Drugs, sex and rock and roll may well be the order of the day. And anyway, why let the facts get in the way of a good story? The bigger the star, the more attractive the target. Realmente, quizá la, la, un poquito, eh, la prensa española ha perdido un poquito la objetividad. Es lo que yo diría, ¿no? Y realmente pues está entrando en una dinámica como la italiana. Hay que buscar noticias cada día, hay que machacar al contrario y todo es un drama. La verdad está allá afuera como un expediente aquí, no, la verdad está aquí, la verdad está en el, está en el marca, está en la prensa deportiva. Yo no podía vivir sin los periódicos deportivos. Whilst coaches withstand the pressure, every statistic imaginable is analyzed before and after the game to determine who got it right. And if all else fails, then it's all down to the luck of the draw. Yet there is always the value of the twelfth man. Rudy Ventura is arguably Barca's most recognized fan. His trumpet has been like a war cry for the Barca supporters to get behind their team in a time of need. And wherever Barca go, Rudy is sure to follow. Barca! 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 Come match day, the extremists and most vocal vie for center stage. Madrid, there will be few Barca fans. They know that being the away side and wearing the Blaugrana will be like showing a red rag to a ball. Como yo, que venimos de otros equipos y tampoco has jugado Barça Real Madrid.
Toda esa gente te, te va haciendo ver la importancia que tiene el partido para ellos, ¿no? Tenemos lo mejor. Si hasta las rosas son blancas. Es de Real Madrid, la rosa. Ole. If there's one character who's become as much an icon as the team, it's Jordi Coulet. A creation of journalist Oscar Nebrada, he's the alter ego in shape and manners of the Barça culé, or typical fan where winning is everything. Resulta que hubo un penalti, un penalti que tenía que tirar el Hugo Sánchez, que era un delantero del Madrid que era muy odiado por los culés. Y el portero del Sevilla era uno que le habíamos cedido nosotros, que era el Unzue. Entonces, eh, cuando lo tiró, el Unzue se lo paró. Entonces, yo estaba en un bar de la costa, allí en la Costa Brava, aquel día, y entonces todo el bar se levantó y hizo así, ¿sabes? Como, como diciendo, toma butifarra que te ha parado el penalti. Y entonces en aquel momento los de la tele se les ocurrió poner al Jordi Culé. Entonces salió el Jordi Culé y hizo... y se fue. Y entonces se montó un follón, porque claro, se, los, todos los de Madrid, todos los, de, los del Bilbao, los del Sevilla, lo vieron aquello y dijeron, pero esto qué es, cómo puede hacerse burla de un equipo por una televisión pública. Y entonces en Cataluña dijeron que era lo más grande que se había hecho nunca en televisión. <risa> With the kickoff on a countdown, the tension for player and fan is now at fever pitch as each team tries to build confidence for the battle ahead. Whilst Barca steal themselves, the Madridistas view the enemy like lambs being brought to the slaughter with their heroes invincible. This sea of white is like an extra defender that can easily destroy the most seasoned performer. Whilst Madrid salute their fans, team confidence is now essential. Stars need to deliver, officials need to be in firm control, and management will keep an ever watchful eye. Now it's all down to the moment, and who has the most passion and commitment to succeed. La pasión antes era como la de ahora, pero muy diferente. Era una pasión más de equipo eh, y de ciudad eh, que no de como ahora, que esto ya se ha desbordado un poquito ya. ¿Qué pasa? Que no hay niños en España, que no hay futbolistas, que no hay kilómetros de playa, que no hay campos para correr. Eh? ¿Qué pasa? Que tanto extranjero. El primer año que llegué yo aquí, pues solo podían jugar tres extranjeros. Los ocho restantes éramos españoles. Ahora prácticamente jugamos dos o tres españoles, nada más, ¿no? Nos gustaría que hubiera más jugadores de casa, pero por encima todo queremos tener los mejores jugadores que hay en cada momento en el mundo, ¿no? Whatever the argument regarding preference for local players or expensive imports, this is arguably the biggest club game in the world. And the never-ending war has begun amongst the League of Nations. As an ex-Madrid player, Luis Enrique is the target for a torrent of abuse. He's committed the cardinal sin of defecting to the enemy. A sloppy foul causes concern amongst the Barca defense. The free kick creates a window of opportunity for dead ball specialist, Brazilian Roberto Carlos. At almost 40 meters away, anybody else would be thinking of a cross, but not Roberto Carlos. First blood to Madrid. At 120 kilometers an hour, there's little the keeper could do except clutch at straws. The days of winning away from home are few these days. Barca will be climbing a mountain and being harassed all the way. Rivaldo, in particular, is a constant target. In the eyes of the home fan, any decision that's against Madrid has to be unfair, and they let the opposition know it only too well. Tempers are flared and close to boiling point already. It needs a strong hand to pacify this outburst with everyone keen to get involved. Once more, Roberto Carlos strikes into the heart of the Barca defense. And in a comedy of errors, bad boy Anelka swoops to make the score 2-0. Barca are all at sea, their confidence shaken. Madrid are jubilant. Goals are hard to come by at the best of times, but two in 20 minutes against the old enemy is not bad going. Figo tries hard to exert some of his own magic to get Barca back into the game.
but almost is not good enough. A frustrated Luis Enrique lets his emotions get the better of him. Another driving run by Figo earns a free kick, and the other Brazilian specialist, Rivaldo, steps up to take it. Only to be denied by the width of the woodwork. A great run and interchange between Kluivertz and Rivaldo sets up Luis Enrique, but young keeper Isaac Casillas is too quick, much to the crowd's delight. Into the second half, and Kluivert sets up Luis Enrique again, only for him to be bundled over with no foul. Roberto Carlos shows a touch of arrogance as he goads the Barca defense before setting up Morientes, whose charging run is stopped just short by a desperate tackle. A cavalier run by the classy Redondo carves a hole in the Barca defense. An interchange with Salgado and Morientes turns in a flash, whipping the ball home for goal number three. Morientes can't contain himself. Whilst the dejected Rivaldo feels the isolation as the crowd chorus for the magical five. And one fan shows his belief in divine assistance. For coach Del Bosque, who's had a rocky ride since taking over, it's good seeing it all come together. Redondo's surging runs are causing all sorts of problems, and Barca's desperate solution provokes another confrontation with Luis Enrique once more in the thick of it. Frustrated Figo tries hard to find a way through Madrid's resolute defense, but with no more luck than before. Luis Enrique's second rush of blood has booked him an early exit, much to the satisfaction of the gloating Madrid fans. The normally dangerous Rivaldo has found little to be pleased with, as the constant close attention has left him battered and bruised. A silent Barcelona board can only look on ruefully. The powerful runs of local boy Guti have earmarked him as a name for the future. A fine cross by the Cameroonian Jeremy sees Raul head just wide. Redondo is a past master at frustration, learned from his days in Argentina. A last gasp effort from Figo is well saved and Barca are a spent force. Victory over Barca is always sweet. The jubilant Madrid fans are in raptures. This was the most decisive win by Madrid since their 5-0 thrashing of Barca back in 1995. A despondent Rivaldo can only limp off and think of the return match in Barcelona. With such high stakes, the survival ratio of coaches at this level is understandably short term. The initial euphoria often only lasts while the ink on the contract is still wet. Results are everything and the rewards are high as long as they continue. But you get one chance only and even with the honors, there's no guarantee of survival. No matter how hard they try, it's communication and delivery on the field that counts. Once the confusion begins, the downward spiral is hard to stop. Lack of player confidence, coupled with lack of results, leads to the inevitable. With so much expectation and firepower, Barcelona's erratic performance and ultimate demise at the hands of Valencia in the European Champions Cup was the final insult to their fans. As the results failed to materialize, the fans called for the heads of Dutch coach Van Gaal and long-standing president Josep Nunez. 
Elections were now due, ironically, for both clubs. For Barca, veteran vice president Joan Gaspar was the front runner, based primarily on his experience. And everybody knew Barca blood ran genuinely through his veins. His famous promise to jump into the Thames River if Barca won the European Cup in 1992 won him votes in reserve, much to the discomfort of Nunez, who guarded his throne jealously. Unlike Nunez, Gaspar knew the value of club members at grassroots level, and more importantly, knew what effect it would have on the ballot box. For Madrid president Lorenzo Sanz, although disliked, survival still seemed assured. President hopeful Florentino Perez was an outsider, but with a public secret many Madridistas would be influenced by. Predictably, Gaspard won the Barça vote and confidently greeted the press with an undertaking. Joan Gaspard is Joan Gaspard. I la renovació del Barça us la puc garantizar. Gaspard's immediate test would come with Perez's confirmation that Barça superstar Luis Figo had signed for Madrid for a world record 50 million dollars. For Madrid fans, this was manna from heaven. For Barça fans, it was catastrophic. Not only had the board lied, but Figo, who'd sworn his allegiance many times with Barça, had joined the enemy. To switch camps was a sensitive issue in which previous Barca idol, Michael Laudrup, had felt the full brunt of the fans' anger. He'd been traumatized by their reaction and the brutal treatment dished out by his previous teammates. When someone you love a lot is the enemy most hated of all time, that has the risk of becoming the opposite. When I went to play in Real Madrid, the affection is the opposite. Siempre me habían tratado muy bien allí, ¿no? Lo único que un jugador que juega primero en un equipo y luego se va al otro, pues siempre es considerado como una especie de traidor. For the derby return, the camp knew would be the focus of high drama, and Figo knew he was in for a rough ride. Barça fans lay in wait with a suitable welcome. The rumor that an open checkbook had been dangled in front of Figo only made matters worse. This was the one occasion the fans could vent their feelings to the extreme. As expected, Figo's appearance triggered a torrent of abuse. Anything white was rubbished and the claret and blue defiantly thrust in his face. For Barca coach Serra Ferrer, it would also be a major test. Every touch and move from Figo provoked a barrage of whistling. It had been 17 years since Madrid had won at the Camp Nou, and under the present circumstances would need a minor miracle for a repeat. A clumsy tackle by Madrid captain Hierro on Rivaldo gave Barca an early opening. It only needed a slight touch by Luis Enrique to put Barca one up. Figo was already yesterday's hero, with the fans eager to humiliate him further. Technically, it was an own goal, but Barca were ahead, and that's all that mattered to the fans. Although the heavens opened up, the rain did nothing to dampen the spirits of the jubilant Barca fans. An ugly display by Barca extremists, much to the concern of the new presidents, saw bottles rain down on Figo, as police quickly reacted to stamp out the incident. Madrid's coach anxiously tried to inject some more firepower, but it was Figo who came closest to obliging. However, it was the Brazilian maestro, Rivaldo, who proved to be the difference, setting up Portuguese international Simão with the easiest of chances. It was not a memorable goal, but enough to settle the result of the game, all played off the field and on. Vigo's return would not be forgotten, nor the bond between old friends. The war of white versus claret and blue still continues, but not without a sense of mutual regard. Old memories may fade, but are never forgotten. 
The golden era will always be remembered for the genius of Di Stefano and Kubala. They set the standard for others to follow with a passion that has made this derby one of the greatest of them all.